thought I'd get us going here. Um, so this is uh, one of the, our more thematic episodes. I mean, we have talked about the Holocaust. It's impossible not to for two reasons. One, because I'm teaching it, and hey, you know, I do feel it's really important. And you know, and when I was a kid, I think we we tended, to, and a younger rabbi, we tended to say, let's not focus on the Holocaust so much. But th if we're talking about the last half century of Jewish ideas, um, it's impossible not to. And especially the people we're going to talk about today who've made such a difference, who've been so instrumental in helping us to understand and to carry on. So um, this is, uh, while in Hebrew school, we're not teaching Holocaust all the time, in this class, it tends to come up a lot. <laughs> so I, I don't know if I should apologize for that or just say it as a statement of truth, uh, but um, there's no way we can even just go by the book, you know, go by the Jewish canon book. Uh, there are just so many writers who dealt with the Holocaust in different ways. So uh, this happens to be the week, as you know, um, I think, I mean, I'm not going to assume you know that. This is the International Holocaust Memorial Week or Day, uh, which always occurs on January 27th, and was set, I uh, believe, to correspond with the liberation of Auschwitz back in 1944. Um, but the important thing is that it, it exists and we've had some um, some interesting shifts, uh, especially even just this week. The UN um, is now beginning to show real understanding and support for the uh, mem memorialization of the Holocaust, how important it is, particularly um, in opposition to those who would deny it. Um, so you're seeing it's not just Jews who are screaming when someone denies the Holocaust or minimizes it. Now we're seeing it on a more official basis and a more universal one, and that's that's a good thing. But just having this um, Memorial Day, this Remembrance Day is important too. Of course, for Jews, the Remembrance Day for the Shoah is Yom HaShoah, and that occurs in the spring around Passover, and that has its own sort of uh, rhythm of the calendar connected to Passover and Israel's Independence Day the following week. But this one, um, this fits well too. It fits well historically. And uh, it's nice to sort of balance it, that it, uh, it's not exactly at the time of Yom HaShoah. And it enables us, meaning Jews, to, um, to balance our perspectives on the Holocaust. Um, whereas on Yom HaShoah, there's a real focus on the Jewishness of the incident, of the experience. And it, of course, the uniquely Jewish aspect of it is very important. Here we also talk about that. We can't talk about the Holocaust without doing that. It's, it's very dangerous <laughs> to do that. Um, it's wrong to do that. It's, it's, I'll, I'll tell you why it's dangerous, but it's wrong. Um, but we also can draw universal lessons at the same time. We can recognize, for instance, that others died, many others died. Um, and people, of course, Jews were the only ones targeted for total extinction, total extermination, um, because they're Jews. But, um, but others certainly suffered. And there are also other lessons to learn. We have, during this period, this half century, this is when Jewish museums Holocaust museums, rather, began to proliferate, um, yeah, Holocaust yeah. memorials. And so um, we have, of course, the um, U.S. Holocaust Museum that um, came into play. And it's mentioned in the Deborah Lipstadt article. Um, so each of these museums has a different purpose. They complement one another. Each by itself, I think, is insufficient. Although I have to say, I don't see a need for a Holocaust memorial in every community, every Jewish community even. Um, it's enough to have some very big ones that we make pilgrimage to. But for instance, Yad Vashem does focus on the unique Jewish elements, the unique Jewish narrative of the Holocaust, which um, at, at one point in its old museum, before the one that's, uh, that's in my background was built, um, perhaps was not 
was a little too unsubtle in saying that Israel was the response to the Holocaust. Israel was the <laughs> was the important um, Jewish response to the Holocaust, but also the world needed to have an Israel. And Israel, in a theological sense, may even be God's response to the Holocaust. You know, that that's for the Yitz Greenbergs of this world to figure out. Um, you have in Los Angeles, the Museum of Tolerance, and that focuses on tolerance. It focuses on, com on combating hate. Um, the museum in Washington, uh, because it's in Washington, and has to sort of justify the fact that it's one of the prime real estate addresses um, of it's within the, the confines of the Smithsonian acre and you know those several blocks of museums. So it has to focus on the American experience. I think it wants to focus on the American element there and on making the Holocaust relevant, uh, not just for Jews, but for all Americans. And perhaps to a fault in that it um, talks about the liberation of the camps as a very proud American moment, and not as much, and I haven't been there in a, in a while, but not as much the involvement um, or the non-involvement of America in uh, what it could have done to bomb the tracks and uh, address some of the issues a lot earlier when they first heard what was going on. So you have America, you have America in Washington, you have the Museum of Tolerance, you have the museum in New York, which personalizes, I think, the Holocaust. If you've been to the one down in the Battery, it's a beautiful museum, Jewish Heritage Museum. It, it puts it in the context of Jewish heritage, of the life of Jews before and after the Holocaust. Um, you see that also in Poland, the museum there, and to a degree, actually, in Berlin, in the Holocaust Museum there, um, where there's a degree of pride in Poland, especially um, at the, the how lively Jewish life, how culturally rich it was immediately before the Holocaust, but also, of course, for centuries before. And in New York, you see a little of that. It talks about Europe, but you also talk about Jewish life, Jewish culture in general, and then also after the Holocaust. So you have these museums, each of them sort of taking on their different character. All of that sort of um, just coming out of my saying that this Thursday is Holocaust Remembrance Day. That's why we have three readings about the Holocaust right now, but we could have had more. Um, this, uh, the book is filled with, um, you know, with discussions of the meaning of the Holocaust, but anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through Lipstadt, um, Wiesel, and then, uh, Levy, if we have a chance, hopefully we will. But for each of them, I, I, the whole concept here that we, we see in these three readings, Eliach, of course, also is part of the Lipstadt reading, it's about memory. And the key question for this generation of American Jews, this generation meaning from, and just because it's a good arbitrary date, 1967, that that's when so much changed. Um, if you're looking Lipstadt for it in the book, by the way, it's 181, right. The Lipstadt article. I'm sorry if you hear my dog in the background. He's upstairs. I don't know. Can't get farther away, but I still hear him. All right. So the um, whole question of memory is so crucial. It's how is the Holocaust going to be remembered? Um, is it going to be remembered? I think that's the most fundamental question, the first question. And how to activate the memories, how to activate the next generation who never experienced these events personally, so that they can become active witnesses. They can become, become as the, the term that's used, sort of custodians of memory. Wiesel was obsessed with this. Lipstadt is obsessed in a different way, and so is Eliach. Levy will get to it, and he was too. Um, so I think what we need to do is, is ask two questions. One, how did they address this? And two, have they succeeded? And are we set up? Is the next generation set up? Meaning, by the way, for all of us here, the people who will live after we are not around. 
Because I think that's a more important way of looking at it than just saying our children and grandchildren. Well, you know, many of us know our children and grandchildren uh, and or whatever. But or we know other people's children and grandchildren. But I think it's really about what we're leaving behind. What is going to be in not just 10 years, 15 years, but 50 years down the road? Are we setting things up for success? And so there are key elements to that. They're very practical. You know, we talked about theology before. We talked about, for instance, Yitz Greenberg. Very important stuff. Wiesel gets into theology a little too. Like he, you know, how do you explain God? But his book, Night, pretty much does it by saying there can't be a compatible understanding of God with what I've been through. But he's more important about, you know, that, that we have memory. So Lipstadt, we can start with her because she's actually in the news. She's always in the news. You know, um, I don't know how many of you have Netflix, but I was sort of skimming around Netflix the other day. And, you know, I always like put in search Jewish, Israeli, you know, you know me, I'm never not looking for this stuff. I should like, you know, take a day off at some point, but you can't take a day off from loving being Jewish. So QB7 was on, did, is anyone, did anyone see that when it was, uh, it was on ABC in the late seventies, I'm guessing maybe even a little earlier, um, 1970s, it was, uh, it was Leon Uris's novel about a trial that took place in London on Queen's Bench 7. That's how you get the title QB7. And it had Anthony Hopkins and Ben Gazzara as the perpetrators. Oh, bunch of stars. Um, and I remembered seeing it when it first came out. But I, I was looking at it now from a different perspective. So anyway, it was the trial. Ben Gazzara was um, sort of a... Uh, a lost soul, a Jew who felt a sense of um, connection to the Jewish people, not religious at all. Um, his father was very religious. His father was Orthodox and he probably rebelled against his father, but he was a successful novelist. And his father dies. He goes to Israel. He has an awakening. It's the 67 war, of course. And so he writes a book about the Holocaust, because that really is the tool of his awakening, the avenue of, of his Jewish identification, which I think is the case for many of that generation. And I think I sort of include myself there. Um, the, the whole notion of, of fighting off the negativity and fighting off the victimhood through Jewish strength, which Israel represented after the Six Day War, but also never forgetting, never forgetting. So he writes a book. And the book then goes on to uncover some of the experiments that were done uh, in the camps, um, the Mengele types of experiments. And he targets Hopkins character as one who did it. Now he's a reputable, um, admirable doctor in England at this time, and he's covered it up. Um, he had at one point been accused, but it was by the Polish government that had, all, had its own agenda. It was a communist government at the time. So the trial is a um, it, it is a trial where the Polish um, Jewish non-Jewish rather doctor is suing for libel um, the Jewish novelist and who had written a historical book about the Holocaust. So you have this lawsuit going on. In the end, actually, the 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 the, the doctor wins, but he wins the equivalent of like half a penny which means he loses. And it's in, in a, oh, I just gave it away. I'm sorry. You don't, you should still watch it. It's really interesting. Spoiler alert. You can rewind, whatever. All right. Anyway, the whole thing just said to me, it screamed to me, Deborah lips that. Because that is exactly, although slightly different scenario, it, it sort of previewed what she went through with her book and her book um, on not Holocaust itself, but Holocaust denial. That is her thing. She's a great historian. I said she's in the news. She's in the news because she's supposed to be the administration's envoy um, to, <laughs> to the anti-Semites. No, to, to fight anti-Semitism. I mean, she's, she, you know, yeah. it's so important that our administration, that our government is assigning, designated a person 
for congressional approval to handle the issue of anti-Semitism, especially after what happened last week. Everything is in the news. And Ted's, I think it's Ted Cruz who doesn't like her. Um, he, it's been blocked by Republicans and I don't really understand why, because it just does, it's not a good look. But um, anyway, Deborah Lipstadt has spoken out and continues to against Holocaust denial. And in this case, um, her most famous case in the 1990s, and this is the one that's spoken about in this book, um, it's, it's um, about David Irving, the notorious um, Holocaust denier. And, and she exposes exactly how he does his thing, how he denies, and the basic tactics and the way to fight it. And she just lays out the roadmap of how and when to ignore them, to not give them oxygen, and how you have to at times fight and you have to always be armed with the truth and armed with the facts, but not to give credence to anything that they say. So of course she had to then face him down in court and a great movie called um, Denial came out <laughs> about five years ago. Do you remember seeing it? Rachel Wise played her I mean, you know, <laughs> she was very happy about that. Yeah, you know, if you can get like Rachel Weisz to play, I, if, she, if she could play me sometime, I'd be really thrilled. Um, she's an amazing actress and uh, she did a great job. So uh, anyway, so Deborah Lipstadt is a key factor here. And for her, the whole thing about memory is preserving the authenticity of the Holocaust. It's, it's about making sure that denial can't happen. That denial is, in, to deny denial. And, and we we're now at the point, we're at a crucial sort of nexus. It's almost like the roof over my head here in my background. We're at a point where either it's gonna go one way or another. We, we are dealing with fewer and fewer survivors you know, it used to be, and I think she spoke about it, and that, that if you wanted to bring a survivor into a classroom, you just sort of say, all right, what do you want? Someone who was from Minsk, someone who was at Auschwitz, someone who, you know, Warsaw, whatever, pick your, pick your person. Um, now, you just want someone who's able to coherently, you know, come before a group, probably online. They're all in their 90s and older. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna be a world without survivors very soon, and we need to get the facts out, and we need to make sure that in a generation, again, fifty years from now, people won't be able to say, "Well, no one here was around to see it," so maybe it didn't happen. So you have to accumulate all of the facts, all the evidence. Everything has to be told again and again and again, and you know, and, and then we have to discredit denial so much. And that's where the UN comes into play and things like, you know, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, there just has to be such a consensus that this thing happened, that uh, it can never be denied. It can never be plausibly denied. Um, what do you think? Do you think we're on, uh, we're sliding toward danger because every, all the survivors are, are leaving us or are we heading toward critical mass of, of truth where people won't, maybe they'll, you know, they're, they're not ashamed to be anti-Semites at this point, but are they ashamed to deny the Holocaust? Sandy, what do you think? You know, I'm not really sure about, I think the anti-Semites will find ways in which to disparage Jews, but I think you're right that they know when to draw the line about saying that the Holocaust did not exist. But we are on a slippery slope because as you said, with all of our Yom HaShoah um, commemorations at the synagogues, we've always had someone who was either at the camp or was hidden away by a Christian family. And those people themselves are as you say, aging and gone. And even though Steven Spielberg does have the amazing show up project, you really need something a little bit more concrete. And I, I realized about a couple of years ago when there was an article 
about uh, a young boy whose grandfather was in uh, Auschwitz. And the grandfather was very, very open with the grandson as to what had, had transpired. And the young man decided without any prodding as he got a little bit older, that he had the number that his grandfather had in the camp tattooed on the same place, I believe on his arm. And a lot of people began to ask him, what is this number? What does it mean? Yeah. And so he was someone who took on a tangible role in explaining about his grandfather and what the grandfather had gone through and why the number is on his arm. And I've seen other young people who have done basically the same thing. So I would wonder and hope that there's a concrete way for those who have a closer connection to the Shoah, to the righteous Gentiles, the the people that were in the camps, to maybe come out and be a bit more verbal and vocal as to what they're doing. Um, yeah. That would perhaps, you know, push it forward for maybe another generation. And then it's up to the next generation to come up with ways in which to further that it becomes not just something that happened, but a living memory of what happened. So here is, thank you, Sandy. So here is the uh, the article in the New York Times when it came out. This was April 11th, 2000. That was when the trial ended. And uh, here's the end of um, that article. Um, by the way, time, the Times has wonderful archives that if you're a subscriber, you can search online. I think it's called the Times Machine. I use it all the time. And um, it's great because you know, it helps to sort of refresh the memory and have, it's, it's a living documentation of, of history. Um, so this is Eliach's thing. While I'm here, I'll just uh, highlight it. This is uh, from the Holocaust Museum in Washington. Um, Yafa Eliach created, recreated her community um, back in, in Poland. And, you know, that, that was, that's her claim to memory for, you know, for one, it's all about denial, denying denial. And um, that that's the, you know, that that's important for Lipstadt. But for Eliach, it's about making sure people remember there was a before. And there were actual people that lived. And the more you see the faces of people who lived before in these communities, um, the more, you know, the, the better it is the better it preserves memory. I'll just, as I have a little close up here, a little bit closer anyway, you can see some of the faces. It's a bit grainy, but it's very powerful. If you've been to the museum in um, in Washington, this tower is very powerful. Um, Jerusalem has a very similar one. This is uh, the cone. At the end of the Jerusalem Yad Vashem exhibit, um, you see all of these faces sort of looking almost like a Dead Sea Scroll, uh, I don't know, case, um, sort of leading toward heaven. It also has, you know, a bit of a, the, the, the look of, of, of a smokestack, too. It's, um, it's both uh, hopeful and, and very sad. Um, but I want to show you. So With go... these photographs, do they have any, are there any blurbs? on who these people were and where they lived and what they did and where they died with photographs. Yeah, I don't know about uh, the one in Washington. I haven't been there in a long time, but I know that in New York, they have a similar wall of photos where there's a, there's a loose leaf binder and mm -hmm. um, people can read about all the people that are on, um, that are on the wall. So, all right, there's one, one expression that she uses, that Lipstadt uses, that I think is, is interesting. It's on page 182. So she says, not ignoring deniers does not mean we engaging them in discussion or debate. In fact, it means not doing that. We cannot debate them for two reasons, one strategic and one tactical. And she goes on to describe uh, those reasons. Um, you don't want it to be the other side because then you sort of have a sense that there are two sides 
you know, how newspapers try to show two sides to an issue. And there is no other side here. There is no other hand, as Tevye would say. Um, then he said, though we cannot directly engage them, there is something we can do. Those who care not just about Jewish history or the history of the Holocaust, but about truth in all its forms, must function as canaries in the mine, once, as canaries did, to guard against the spread of noxious fumes. So she's describing the classic canary in the coal mine, mm -hmm. that Holocaust remembrance, or um, in this case, denying denial, is the canary in the coal mine. This is, a, you know, it, it's a cliche, but it's a really interesting one, and it's one I've used. And a new book just came out, Dara Horn, The World Hates Dead Jews. I tell you, that's, you know, this is all I do. I just read about Jews, Even living ones, dead ones. It's a good book. I haven't finished it yet, but um, very interesting idea that she brings up she says the idea of being a canary in a coal mine is totally wrong because the canary in the coal mine means this the, the logic that she's talking about, and this came out after Charlottesville and other times, if you enable anti-Semitism, if you accept anti-Semitism, then far worse things are going to happen. If you let it happen to the Jews, you know, first they came for me, first they came for the Jews, yes. If it happens, it, then it's going to happen to other groups, it's going to happen to you. But the implication, Dara Horn is saying, is it's not bad enough that it's just happening to the Jews. It's not, you know, that sh that in itself, it shouldn't be about the canary dying. And uh oh, we're now warned that it can happen to other groups. The canary dying is bad for the canary, and it's bad for the world. That anti-Semitism is just as bad as every other kind of hate. So she's being very sensitive to that whole notion. I don't think that's what um, is being talked about here, but I understand why she says it. In the coal mine of hate, there is no canary. Anyone who dies, anyone who is harmed by hate, it's equal. We're all equal. Anti-Semitism, racism, they're all the same. Islamophobia, you know, anti-gay, everything. It's all, all hate is alike. I like that. But there is a canary in the coal mine of truth, of denial of truth. And that's what I find fascinating. That, that is, I think, what Lipstadt is getting at here. If you deny the truthfulness of the Holocaust, which has been so documented, so utterly, completely documented, partly because of all the research that's happened, partly because the survivors finally started to talk and partly because the Germans were such good record keepers that, you know, they, they, they almost despite themselves, they were such good record keepers. And although they did try to wipe out, you know, they tried to destroy the gas chambers in many of the camps um, as the Russians were coming in, especially. So they did try to wipe out some of the memory, but it, it was too late. So if you're going to deny the truth of the Holocaust, then all truth is in danger. And I think that is a that, that is a good thing to say. So I, I, I said at the beginning, the whole thing about Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I've, you know, I've talked about this before, so excuse me if I have, and I don't mean to harp on the last administration. <laughs> you know, it's, it just happens sometimes. Um, there are some things that you need to harp on, like January 6th. This was less so, but it was significant in its own way. The first lie that the Trump administration spoke that had nothing to do with the size of the inauguration was about the Holocaust. Remember, January 27th, and they came out with a statement. They weren't too well organized. I totally am convinced it was a mistake. Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day it, and, and their statement did not mention Jews. It did not mention the Jewish nature of the Holocaust at all. And Sean Spicer, who was the spokesperson at that point, got up and said, oh, no, no, this wasn't a mistake. And then he compounded it 
he just should have said I was wrong, or it, he should have taken the he should have taken the sword. I mean, he did enough times for other things, but he then goes on to talk about if you remember um, Hafez Assad using gas on his own people, who was worse than Hitler, who after all didn't gas his own people. <laughs> Oops, I mean it was like uh, it was it was bad. I, I the exact quote I have in my book actually, but I you know. It's not that important. The point, the important thing is that it was denial in its own small way of the significance of the Holocaust and its Jewish nature. And it was an official document, an official proclamation of the new government that I don't think people at that time were overly concerned would, would, would not, not that it would be anti-Semitic. I think the, the concern was that it might enable anti-Semites, um, especially white nationalists, and that did happen. So it was a bad signal. It was a very bad signal. And the only response that you got was, of course, from the president, I have Jewish grandchildren. And that was it. So this canary in the coal mine, I just I find it to be a really important um, image that's used. Um, OK, so any comments, any questions? I haven't even looked in the chat. I don't think there's anything at the moment. Yeah. I have yes. a question. Yeah, go ahead. When and then Susan. Speak, can we attribute it to wanting to be in the spotlight? Do we attribute it to just their total stupidity? Do we attribute it to a combination of many factors? You're saying deniers? I mean, the, the, yeah, the, these deniers. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's so much material. I I, I find it so hard to believe that these deniers really believe that it didn't happen. And I wonder, for someone like Irving, he's just trying to be in the spotlight. But there are others that just speak out of, out of little knowledge, no knowledge, hinging on the, the brink of stupidity. I just don't know how to, uh, to attribute these people. Well, you know, maybe someone here has an answer. Um, I, I would speculate, A, it's anti-Semitism, purely hatred of Jews. I think that's an important part of it. Because, you know, when, when Jews have g gained sympathy, at least for a time, um, because of the Holocaust, and you don't want, you know, your, your enemy, the, pe the person you hate, to be loved by anyone else or to be sympathized. And Israel partly was uh, able to be established because of that. Um, but I also think it undermines a lot of important things Jews are trying to accomplish in this world. Um, one is to prevent future holocausts and to fight for social justice. And it empowers us, as Wiesel talks about, you know, as, as many talk about, that we have a very special role here. I think in some of the essays, you know, we are empowered by our memory. Um, by our being the ambassadors, the custodians of memory. So it takes away some of that power. And, you know, it, at times that can have political consequences um, for policies um, that, that we are looking out for. Um, but, it, you know, it's almost just cruelty for its own sake, too. And um, it also, all right, here's the other thing. And this is where it gets back to Sean Spicer. Once you start to cloud the truth, you can cloud it for anything. So once you, if, if you know, it's the Holocaust is, let's forget the canary in the coal mine, it's New York, New York. If, if clouding the truth can make it here, it can make it anywhere. If you can convince someone that the Holocaust may not have happened, and already David Irving and, and Lipstadt talks about this. David Irving is getting people, her students, Lipstadt said, she's hearing her students ask the same questions that Irving's asked. Could it really happen? How do we know? So already they're playing on his playing field. If you can cloud the truth of this, the most, okay, I'm gonna just say it. I have to use my words. Uh, hello? No, 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 that's what I'm looking for. Here. Okay. <laughs> From my book. Holocaust denial is the canary in the coal mine of Orwellian doublethink. 
the mother of all fake news, in that if it not only defies all standards of empirical science and rejects meticulously documented history, which any act of historical denial might do, but in this case, doing so also attempts to whitewash the greatest moral crime ever perpetrated. There is and never has been a greater, more bald-faced lie than the denial of the Holocaust. That alone, that fact alone warranted an official immediate White House retraction. No one puts it better than I can when I can actually sit down and write it, as opposed to trying to say it right here. Um, so I'm being humble about that. Uh, others can put it better than me. Anyway, so this is, you know, this is really, really important stuff. And it's not just about denial, it is about memory. And of course, it's about every conspiracy theory we're dealing with now. We're talking about rewriting history of January 6th. We're talking about soon they'll be rewriting history of the pandemic. Go ahead, Roz. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan had her hand oh, up. Sorry, okay. Susan and then Roz. Hi, thanks, Rabbi. Um, two things. First, in, in answer to the question that you asked at the very beginning or towards the beginning, um, just leave it like that. I, th I am concerned more with, n not with the Holocaust deniers, but the notion that when anti Semitic people when they they use they seem to use the Holocaust, they don't deny it, but when it's brought up, it seem it's used as oh they're bringing up the Holocaust again. It, it just yeah. kind of blaming us for just oh they're gonna they're gonna rest their laurels on the Holocaust. It's like that's always something that we fall back on. So the answer um, is excuse me for living. Literally, right? Excuse but that's, I think that's more frightening, more and, and more real a threat than, than the denial in my mind. It does try to, um, to shortchange it, to minimize it. Um, it's, a, it's a trick. It's, definitely it's, it's kind of like, you know, it's over, it's done with, get over it. Right, Let's get over it. On. That's a great, that's a great one. It will the never other be thing I, over. The other thing I really just wanted to ask, did you get the email I sent you with the letter? Remind me of it, because I don't know if I had a chance to read it yet. My, uh, <clears throat> my husband's niece's fiance <laughs> has a letter, and he sent me um, a transcribed portion of it that was written by his grandmother on May 22nd, 1945. She was a nurse at the Ninth Evac Hospital in Germany. And they set up an evac hospital at Dachau. Wow. And she describes the, she describes everything that she saw there. And she was absolutely horrified. Um, you know, apparently it was a very long letter with a lot of personal family stuff in it, but he typed out the section that had to do with, uh, with what she observed at Dachau. And there's all sorts of things that, you know, that I'm sure we could all say, of course she saw that. But the thing that strikes me as being pertinent to this conversation. And these are the kind of things that in in the face of, you know, Holocaust deniers and all, and this is not a, a Jewish person, this is a Christian American nurse who was um, stationed in the evac hospital there. Um, she says, you know, everything you've read about the Nazis and their cruelties is true. Believe me, and don't for a minute think it's all propaganda. Every word is true. I've seen it with my own eyes and heard the stories with my own ears. And then she goes on to talk about how she hates every German. Um, she thinks all the Germans, including the civilians, should be severely punished. And she goes on and she describes the 
crematory and the bodies and and everything else that that they found there and all the people who were just skin and bone suffering from typhus and yeah you have it i yeah, sent no, it to I, you. I, will, I will i will look at it. thank you okay <laughs> I will look. But anyway, yeah, I thought that part, you know, it, I think it's important that that people who are otherwise really just unconnected to the ho Holocaust, that we get these stories out that, you know, this yes. was not propaganda. What you read in the in the newspaper and Newsweek and, and all of those things, it's not just um, right. It's not exaggerated. And we I have mean, to this, become we have to now become the activated proxy for the survivors and you know and our memory needs to be activated um, because the personal experiences are very important and then that gets into uh and i'll get to you Roz, in a second but that gets into um some of the um the uh Aishikian community mm -hmm. from yafa mm -hmm. eliach so Roz, what did you want to say well a few things one thing is when you talk about remembering and the Holocaust is so gigantic, you probably just read in the paper this week how there is a new museum of um, Hollywood history or something like that. And they created this new museum and they uh, did not put into this museum the first generation of people who were all Jews who created Hollywood. <laughs> like there is a new museum and the museum has been reviewed and all and they i mean there's a lot of talk about it i've read articles in the forward that they have this new museum and they did not put anything about the jews who were the creators of all the studios i guess we don't own <laughs> hollywood after all so um also I, you know when you talk about history and being concerned and you said we have to activate the people to to keep keep it alive you know it sometimes concerns me how it could be kept alive to the degree that we have who are just a generation removed um in two generations or three generations or will it be just like the civil war history, like something you'll read in a book that in certain times, this horrible thing happened without all the passion that we know about it. I mean, that's that has always concerned me. Then I don't know if you're planning to speak about the um, the Primi Levy article. Yeah, we, but the of all these things of these three really good articles, I don't want to say most of the stuff I know, but I've read it before. But the thing that most um, got to me was the discussion of the gray zone, because that's yeah, something I never that. thought of, I never thought about, and I was like really taken aback by that. So I hope you will touch upon that. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think. Well, of course, we can always push some over for next time. But I, um, I hate to give Ellie Wiesel short shrift. <laughs> go, go, go right but, ahead. No, but, but, but in a way, he's he is so known. So maybe we should focus on on these on that one. I, so let me make a few points quickly. Um, important points, though. Again, it's about memory. So part of the memory that Eliach is dealing with is the personal stories, and we need to get those personal stories out. But the danger, and we see in the in the mm -hmm. essay here, is that sometimes personal stories can be distorted or changed, or you know, so you start to lose that purity of history that you get in statistics and in historical research, um, such uh, as we have, uh, you know, against the Holocaust denial that Lipstadt is so involved in. The other thing that you see from Eliach's work is this sort of constant refrain as she tells the story of pre-war Poland, that they could not conceive of the Holocaust ever happening there, that it can't happen here. <laughs> and she uses this refrain, Esprent, it burns, it burns, the different fires that had to be put out, um, literally, uh, attacks on Jews. There were pogroms in Poland, you know, long before Germany was in the picture. Of course, Poland, is noted for its pogroms so 
you get this uh, this impression that one of the things she wants us to remember is the fact that it can happen anywhere mm -hmm. and that people were naive in thinking it could never happen there. Mm -hmm. And that's a certain, it's a bridge um, that we are now the custodians of this memory. And it's, it's, it's a memory that I'm not sure we want to have. But um, just one other point. And then Le Levy, uh, Primo Levi has memories that also we don't want to have, but that we need to maintain. So, all right, maybe I'll, I'll move ahead of Wiesel. I'll skip Wiesel, who a lot of his stuff, as, as important as he is, and we probably should get back to him, um, he says we're the custodians of memory. Certainly that he used the term memory a lot. Um, this, you know, that we should never be silent. We should never be neutral. We should always take a position. We should always be on the side of, of justice and of the weak. Um, and, and he his balance was always between parochial Jewish concerns, particularistic Jewish ones, and universalistic things like apartheid that he opposed so strongly, um, and even venturing into Palestinian rights at one point in his writings, although toward the end of his career some would say he sold out, others just said he got old and and his deep, deep ties to the Jewish people just came through in a, an almost um, uncritical view of Israel, even as Israel became more problematic on some of these issues. So, you know, I don't know if we need to, to get into that in great depth because I think you're right, we should go to, to Levy. Um, they called it his blind spot, by the way, Wiesel's blind spot that um, when we look to him as a moral compass, um, it was for some disappointing. But all right. So the whole idea of a gray zone and doing research for my book, I, you know, I learned, I had read some of his stuff, but uh, I really wanted to get into it more because it is very important. And, um, and the essay here talks about it's being so important. The fact that collaborators are such an important part of the Jewish community and part of this history is troubling on, on so many levels. For one thing, if the collaboration worked, and, and by the way, first of all, I say, the first thing I should say is that it can't be um, irrevocably condemned. It's gray zone for a reason. If you're the one, the Judenrat, or those working in the gas chambers, you were trying to save your own life and very often the life of your family. Same is true for the supposed uh, betrayer of Anne Frank. This is always in the news. We saw it, it was on 60 Minutes uh, two weeks ago, um, I guess a little over a week ago. And it's been in the news throughout the last uh, several days um, as to this research that's been done, a new book, that they have pinpointed that the guy who called out the hiding places of Jews, including the one where Anne Frank's family was living, um, was a Jewish community member who had a fairly significant position in the government, I mean, in the local government in Amsterdam, and um, actually did manage to uh, avoid the camps because of the information that he gave. So, and, and Anne Frank's father had, had some idea of this or was given this tip at one point. There's, some, uh, there's a letter that, that he signed that, uh, you know, mentions it. So this guy evidently was the guy who turned in Anne Frank. Does that make it, does that change the Anne Frank story one iota? You know, I wrote last week in, in my weekly email, no, because there are a lot of people who betrayed Anne Frank, including our own government in America at one point, because they tried to immigrate here. Um, so I, you know, I, I just, but I think it does give credence to the deniers, not so much the Holocaust deniers that it never happened, but the deniers of um, Jewish victimhood, you know, and saying, well, look what you guys did. 
So that's that's a little bit problematic in my mind, not very, but you know, I could see where the David Irvings of this world could make hay out of it. By the way, there are articles that have come out that have just totally debunked the theory that this guy turned them in. So you have to, you know, you, you need to, to look at all the material. But anyway, it's all a gray zone now. And that gray zone gets back to the whole question that I was asking earlier about the canary in the coal mine of truth. If we're going to start to have a gray zone in terms of morality, when is it right to turn in your neighbor to save your family? You know, it's the Sophie's Choice question, although in that movie, in that novel, it's uh, not a Jew. Um, but it's still the same excruciating question. All right, so that's part of it. That, that's really interesting and, and a little bit troubling. The other troubling thing is how many of the survivors, what percentage of the survivors come from this, and mm -hmm. I don't even want to define it narrowly as a group, because it's not really a group. Mm -hmm. um, now, Levy says, and I, let's see if I can find it. Mm -hmm. I like, oh, I like this one. Okay. No, not everyone, so like. Right, so here it is. Yep. All right, so 173. Let me go down a little, 172. All right, so this is in the essay by Sarah Cushman. Um, he noted, sorry, <laughs> this always happens. It's probably one of my wonderful children. So now I have a dilemma. Do I answer the phone of my child or no, I'm not. Um, all right, he noted that while privileged prisoners were a minority within the the you know the the, the camps population. Nevertheless, they represent a potent majority among survivors. You see that about four or five lines down. Yeah, that was my question. Okay, brilliant minds think alike. No, I mean it. It just jumps out at you. Yes, yes. I mean it doesn't take a brilliant mind. Really, it's it's so scary. Mm -hmm. in a way to think first of all that he thought this i i'm not sure what it means and what its implications are um, obviously if someone was able to escape the gas chambers because they were working in the gas chambers um then there may you know there might be more of them than there are going to be people alive than people who died in the gas chambers but most didn't escape most were eventually killed themselves because they were witnesses. No one wanted them to survive among the Germans. Um, and I think it's sort of simplistic to say that so many of the survivors have blood on their hands. I mean, it's basically what Levy is saying. Everyone who survived had survivor's guilt. I'm, I'm not going to say every single person, but I'm going to say as a general rule, if you survived that, then you must have had a sense of why me, even if the why me is is partly because, you know, you had done things to make it more possible for you to survive. Well, that's a survival instinct. Um, that is why Holocaust survivors did not, in, uh, as a as a rule, talk about their experiences for years, many years, until, and then we use this sort of arbitrary cutoff date, six day war, 70s, you start to see that the importance of them telling their stories, but they wouldn't tell their stories for so long. Anyway, Jeff, Sharon, do you have a question? Well, I, I was gonna say that it seems like there was a, a wide range of so-called privileged prisoners. I mean, it's one thing if you turn in other prisoners and bad things happen to them, uh, but it's another thing if you were chosen to work in the gas chamber because somebody had to do that. You weren't really harming people. And, uh, you know, some, I don't know how many Holocaust books we've read, but it, it's up there. You know, some of them portray people who did that as feeling that, you know, they could at least help some people along the way more than maybe somebody else might. 
So, uh, or even you know, comfort they, someone who's about to die. Right. True, you know, and so you know, the man. word collaborator, I think, is a little too strong. It has a lot of negative connotations, but you know, it's it's more the survival instinct and what you could do to survive. I think there were also some skilled positions in in the camps of people that had skills that would survive because of that. I mean, even things like playing an instrument. There were yeah. orchestras, and so I think there were a number of ways that people found to survive um schindler's people yes um the, the people who left their parents to go off into the woods to become partisans mm -hmm. they left their parents to die it's it's that is the gray zone and that's levy's great contribution because every question like that you know it, and that's why when i was thinking about it in terms of how you know the the sort of torah of auschwitz as opposed to the torah of the bible we have to now redefine what it means to honor your parents. Love, honor your father and your mother. We read in the Ten Commandments this past week. Would that mean dying with them or surviving to tell their story, even though they would be less likely to? Or being a Sonder Commando so that you could tell the story, you could bear witness to the horrible things that have happened and bring comfort to those who are about to die, even though you're helping to bring them to their death. Uh, it's what's, you know, it's sort of like a hospice worker. You can't save them. So you, you know, you're doing what you can for them. And I'm not saying they all did that. I'm just saying that it is such a gray zone. It's a, and, and it is, thank you, Roz, because it's really important for us to cover this, even more important than Ellie Wiesel, whom we've studied forever. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Sally. And then Ron okay, said, I uh, on the minute, maybe I'll just change this. Uh, you're, you're you're fine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, on a positive note, uh, my niece married the son of a Holocaust survivor, who has done an amazing job of educating and helping. Her first uh, project was to identify children that were on the uh, the transport on the train and she's an artist and she actually made a sculpture of each of the uh, cars of the train and got pictures. So they were are showing uh, that. And then uh, that was published as a book and she uh, goes on the March of the Living and has done that. She was saved by a non-Jew in uh, Bratislava, in Czechoslovakia and uh, she didn't stop until she was able to get him honored as a, a what is it they call them? Righteous Gentiles. Yeah. The right, right. And so she took care of that. And so if you're interested in reading her story, her name is Gabriella Karen. And so uh, maybe I'll just put it in the chat. Okay, GabriellaKaren.com. And you. just a marvel. She's been here to Stanford several times and actually interviewed somebody that with her. I was with her over at uh, Edge Hill that had been uh, on the transport. So uh, she's had quite a life and has really dedicated herself to uh, saving the memory. I'll put it into the chat right now. Great, thank you. Uh, Roz, you, you wanted to say something well, else? I, well, Sally pretty much covered some of it because what I was said, you were said, well, you can't, you know, and I would never judge someone who did something that I consider wrong to save their family. But just think of how incredible it was then for the righteous Gentiles who took a Jew into their home and they know that their family could have been killed if they found out. I thought about this so many times. If we had a big thing here and someone told me to take a colleague's family into my house, that could endanger my son, would I be brave enough to do that? What would so, we have done? Right. What What would any of us have done? I think about it very often. Yeah. That, you know, if it was a big race thing and they would take someone who I worked with who happened to be black and said, can I stay in your house? Would I endanger my sons? I don't know if I could have. And so I really admire those that took, who did that. You know, a man comes to the synagogue door uh -huh. and, and looks homeless. And um, Rabbi lets him in. 
right, right. What would I have done? I, I have to ask myself that question. Right. I'm not sure what the answer is. Neither am I. I Those probably wouldn't have given what's happened now, but that's just because of what's happened now. I, you know, maybe mm -hmm. after Pittsburgh, I wouldn't have, but mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to, to answer yeah. these questions. It's very hard. These are the questions. And, and you know, they're, it's important to ask them. Sharon, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. Um, I, I know you uh, said you like to look for Jewish movies. On one of the Jewish websites I get, it may be my Jewish learning, I'm not sure. They mentioned a, a gentleman who um, has watched lots of Jewish movies, Holocaust movies, and his favorite was called The Gray Zone. Um, and I really? didn't know, I'm assuming it has some reference to what we're talking about now. Um, I didn't make the connection before. Um, but it's called The Gray Zone, and he thought it was the best Holocaust movie he had ever seen. So it'd be interesting to look for it now. Well, I, I think it's really important that we follow, even though we're troubled by it, we follow Levy's conclusion that we shouldn't, we shouldn't turn all victims into saints. Mm -hmm. um, they were human beings like the rest of us, mm -hmm. and it, the ones who survived, we shouldn't judge them harshly either. Um, even though maybe the population was skewed a bit more toward those who either had great survival skills or very lucky, or certainly weren't elderly. You know, it's like COVID, I mean, in a way, or, uh, or fragile in whatever way. Um, you know, the, the, it's skewed. I mean, if we think about the Jewish population, which was one third larger in 1939, 18 million down to 12 million by the end of the war, those 6 million weren't evenly divided among the population. First of all, most of them were Ashkenazi, but many were religious, of course, in Poland, um, who were unable to defend themselves. Many were elderly. Um, an entire generation of Torah scholars died that we could never replace. And those who survived, frankly, the, you know, the American Jewish population suddenly became the largest group of Jews in the world. And who came to America in the early 1900s? Those who wanted to escape the traditions of the old country. Um, they used to say, you know, the golden Medina is where you lose Shabbat, where, you know, you, you lose your Jude, you use, lose your Yiddishkeit. And people have found their ways back and some eventually found their way over here, like um, Chabad, you know, started off in, in Europe. But the Jewish people would look very different had the Holocaust not happened. And it's not an even distribution. So these are really interesting questions. One of the things I often think about, I think about the children, all of the children who were killed in the Holocaust, have they survived? What wonders, what miracles, what progress could they have brought to this world to share with everyone, not just with the Jews? And, you know, there are no easy questions. There are no easy answers, but I think as Ross said, you still have to take a look at the gray zone and come up with with a a response that you can feel comfortable with. So that might change as time goes on anyway. Yeah. And I think part of what we have to do now, we're not just telling the story of the Holocaust, we're not just telling the history, we're not just telling the story of the survivors and the victims, we're not just telling the Anne Frank stories. We're also going to be teaching the world, and we're starting to, and, and Primo Levi does, the lessons that we learn about how complex the human spirit is, how it can triumph over such darkness, but at the same time can be tested beyond comprehension. And somehow we need to find within all of that a grounding for what is right and wrong, an ethical system that doesn't depend on the existence of an acting, an active deity. <laughs> That's a, your mission should you choose to accept it. 
I mean, eventually maybe God comes back into the picture, um, but that wasn't the case there. They had to figure out what was right and wrong, despite it all. Um, so anyway, I think that's a good place for us. I'm sorry, Jeff. Uh, sort of building on that, one of the things I often think about, and I assume everybody on this in the class does, is what would I have done in those circumstances? And would I have seen clearly enough what was sort of coming down the road and what was happening? And would I have had the courage to become a partisan fighter or try to leave or, and it just, uh, and, 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 and then I look at what's happening now politically in the country and wonder, you know, are we gonna have to make some decisions? Yeah. Um, but anyway. Well, I mean, one of the more depressing lessons of today is from Yafa Elia. It could happen here, you know, which is what we've been thinking the last couple of weeks, despite you know the way things turned out for the best in uh, in Texas. It still it could happen here. The world loves dead Jews, according to Dara Horn. So um, anyway, I, I, I want to thank Michelle for making some suggestions, and I invite everyone else to do that. If you, if you do have the book. Um, or even if you come off, uh, come across um, the table of contents on it on the website, and there are chapters you want to make sure we get to, um, Oops, send them my way. So uh, yes, yeah, Susan, I see that you have dogs all, on all sides of you, and and you know as long as they don't um, enter the gray zone of of admiring German shepherds. Um, no, I, I don't. Know. <laughs> I, 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 they just, I, on and off. It's been a little bit of a battle here. Their their internal alarm clocks have gone off, saying it's walk time. Okay, all right. So I'm I, going. I get the I get the hint. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you all. I you know I really enjoy these sessions. And um, Rabbi, so, one quick yes. question. Sure. For someone or for um, for Raz the uh, new Hollywood Museum, being that they left out the founding fathers, so to speak, <laughs> who were all Jewish, even though Hollywood is still very Jewish, but leaving out the catalyst, so to speak, is that anti-Semitism or is that? Well, that's a question. And there have been a lot of reactions to it. And I believe the first permanent exhibit will include those people, but that was also because probably Jews funded the museum. Yes. I mean, read up about it and you'll see there have been many articles about this. They weren't this the nicest problem. people either, I have to say. Some of them. Some of them but were not actively Jewish. Yeah, they, they, they were Jewish. <laughs> but not involved Jewish. I'm looking for when our next session is, and I, you know, I don't have the calendar in front of me. Um, but anyway, just uh, usually the Shabbatogram, which is what I go back. Oh, yeah, I'll get the list. It'll it'll it'll, it'll be like... yeah, it'll be in our announcements. It always is. So anyway, so Eileen is getting the list. <laughs> 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 the next one. What is Michelle? What? February first, fifteenth, and twenty second. Oh, so we got three in February. Yep. Ooh, so that's next week. Okay. Yep. Okay, great. Then you don't have to. We don't have to miss each other. All right. So uh, and then we can do the groundhog thing and and have one another one the next day. Um, yeah, you know what? If, if the groundhog comes up and says you have to do the twentieth century all over again, forget it's a it. Big trouble. Right. Or, or even 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 this year. Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a good, safe day and week, and um, we'll talk Thank soon. You. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.